Hi, how's everybody doing today? This is Rich from Rich TV Live with our very special guest, John Arbuthnot, the CEO of Delta 9 Cannabis Inc. How are you doing today, John? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Why don't we get started? And we are live on YouTube, the greatest streaming platform in the universe. And why don't we get started with you telling us a little bit about your high level company history? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I, I guess the full Delta 9 story in a nutshell, uh, we are one of Canada's oldest cannabis companies. Uh, founded in 2012, we became the fourth uh, licensed commercial producer of medical cannabis in December 2013. From there, you know, early years of the company were, were quite modest as a privately held and, and relatively small LP. Uh, 2017 became the real growth year for us. We had an eye towards uh, legalization of adult use cannabis in Canada. Uh, we raised about $10 million throughout the year uh, through several private placements. Uh, took our company public on the Toronto Venture Exchange November 2017. Uh, since that time, we've raised a little over $65 million through a mix of debt and equity. Uh, we now bill ourselves as one of the few vertically integrated cannabis companies. So we're a licensed uh, cultivator, processor. Uh, we uh, participate in the wholesale uh, part of the market across Canada. Uh, we have a business to business segment where we sell our proprietary growing technology. We do consulting and licensing services uh, and sell cannabis genetics. Uh, and we're also a licensed retailer uh, in the province of Manitoba uh, and actually now branching out across Western Canada as well. So again, think we're one of the more unique uh, stories in the space, just given we are touching all of those different verticals where investors can see exposure to growth. Uh, company employs about 300 full-time, mostly out of our Winnipeg-based uh, cultivation and, and wholesale facilities, uh, and also spread across our retail chain uh, across Manitoba. Uh, so that, I guess, is the, the high-level elevator pitch uh, on Delta. Very good. And what makes Delta U9 unique on the cultivation side of the story? Yeah, so cultivation, uh, you know, we're, we're quite a bit different than the big uh, greenhouse uh, or warehouse operators. Uh, we very much like smaller compartmentalized growth and, and all of our cultivation activities are based around uh, a relatively small production unit that we call a grow pot. Uh, it's a proprietary unit as in Delta 9 does manufacture these units, uh, but effectively they are retrofitted shipping containers. Uh, so we take standard 40 foot high cube shipping containers we install customized wall panels, electrical lighting, and HVAC systems. Uh, and what we're left with is, is a cultivation unit that's modular, scalable, and stackable uh, within our warehouse. We grow on multiple tiers. Uh, now we feel there's a number of benefits to this type of cultivation. It gives us a very high level of control over the growing environment. Uh, so keeping in mind we're one of the more experienced LPs in terms of cannabis cultivation, uh, we know that to produce a high quality output product, uh, there has to be a large degree of emphasis on the input factors that directly contribute to product quality. So uh, temperature, humidity, light intensity, uh, CO2 saturation, all of that's dialed in very precisely within these relatively small uh, chambers. Uh, it is customized to the unique genetic strain of cannabis that we're growing. And the idea here is we're looking to fall into the very high quality uh, end of the uh, industry as opposed to the more commoditized uh, outdoor or greenhouse growing. Uh, part of the sector. So uh, we feel very much that the foundation on which we build a brand is quality. Uh, and we feel that our cultivation facilities are, are kind of the base uh, to build a business from there. Uh, other big benefits, uh, I think that goes often missed is compartmentalization of risk. Uh, we, we've heard now the horror stories from some of the large LPs and the large greenhouse facilities uh, in terms of crop losses. Uh, at the end of the day, this is an agricultural product. Uh, it is uh, you know, susceptible to crop crop loss, crop failure, uh, spread of diseases, infestation, et cetera. So putting it into these smaller compartmentalized units uh, means that we're effectively mitigating that risk uh, to investors. Uh, the other component is economic. Uh, so given we manufacture these pods ourselves, a lot of the eye in doing this was return on invested count. Uh, so we're expanding right now for a little bit less than $100 a square foot uh, to build out our cultivation facilities where industry average would be, you know, in the area of $300 a foot. Uh, each $25,000 grow pod will put out about 32 kilos of output cannabis uh, in terms of dried flower output per year. Uh, so on that $25,000 investment, uh, we're seeing about $150,000 in value uh, at wholesale. 
Uh, so a very attractive return on that invested capital. It comes in the first 12 months uh, after the investment cycles. And a lot of the positioning here was, was high quality, uh, manage our risk so that we're more of a manufacturing company than an agricultural company, uh, build brand equity, uh, and as well, there's a strong economic case to be made for the production platform. Wow, that's impressive. Now, what kind of portfolio of products does Delta 9 offer its customers? Yeah, so most of the focus to date uh, and through the first 12 months of legalization, obviously, has been dried flour. Uh, as one of those original licensed producers, we have a genetic library of about 75 plus uh, different varieties. Oh, wow. uh, so it gives us you know, a large pipeline of products to be bringing on new strains. A lot of the trending in the first 12 months from the end consumer uh, has been towards high potency products. Uh, so we have a, a large number of high potency products that we've brought on. Uh, we're starting to commercialize larger batches. Uh, but it, again, it gives us, a, I think, a, a solid pipeline of high quality, high potency products to be bringing through into the market. Uh, on an ongoing basis and really give the consumer not only quality, but also novelty uh, in terms of exposure to new strains and, and new products. Another big trend that we've seen over you know, the last two quarters has been the consumer transition towards pre-roll products. Uh, you know, we, we certainly were not the first to market with our pre-rolls, uh, but we launched our pre-roll line Delta 9 Bliss on June 1st this year. Uh, just in the first two months, we sold well over 100,000 uh, units uh, of pre-rolls. Uh, so huge uptake from the end consumer. We almost can't produce these things fast enough. Uh, so, you know, and, and we'll speak a little bit more on the benefits that, that we feel are there in being a licensed retailer as well, but that was certainly one of them, was getting that feedback very quickly uh, in that consumer trend towards pre-rolls, uh, investing in setting up our pre-rolls product line, bringing those out to market and, and really not necessarily doing it first, but doing it right. Uh, so again, we feel there's a number of benefits to being integrated in the retail platform. Uh, in terms of rounding out the product portfolio, our focus for legalization 2.0 uh, over the next few months uh, is going to be into the vaporizable oils category. Uh, we were recently licensed in the last 45 days uh, by Health Canada for oils sales. Uh, so we're now proceeding into the market with our ingestible oils, uh, the lead forward uh, into this fall will be the vaporizable oils category. We really see uh, dried flour, pre-rolls, and vaporizable oils, the pens, the cartridges, uh, as being the highest uptake categories. Uh, you know, looking at comparable U.S. markets that are a little bit more developed, those three categories are usually making up about 70% plus of overall industry revenues. So, you know, from there, again, similar commentary to our pre-rolls, we will have a very good idea by the end of Q1 next year what are the high impact categories? Where have the successes and failures been in the market? And when we look to invest in, you know, expanding our derivatives product portfolio, uh, it's not going to be guesswork. We're going to do it right as we expand out that portfolio over the next few years. Wow, that's uh, that's pretty incredible to to think that people are that lazy that they're buying <laughs> pre rolls like crazy. It's well, interesting. It, it may not just be laziness. Uh, you know, a lot of the people just don't know how to roll a joint. So I, I, yeah, some you know, I didn't think about that. That's a good point, especially with this new legalization. I guess there is a lot of people that maybe have never rolled a joint and say, hey, you know what? Roll it for me. That's interesting. Absolutely. Now, what about distribution strategy? Okay. What makes Delta 9, what markets are Delta 9 currently servicing? Yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll touch on, you know, just for a moment, production capacity, and, and we've really been ramping that up over the last, uh, yeah, well, the last 18 months, but uh, currently licensed for about 5,300 kilos uh, per year. Uh, so that's 202 of our modular grow pods that are currently in production. Uh, we are pending Health Canada approval on another 95 or 96 pods, which will take us up to about 8,500 kilos per year, and currently uh, building out the balance of our phase uh, to expansion, which will take us up to about 16,000 kilos. Uh, so it gives you a sense of kind of that incremental expansion. Uh, we have released our expansion plans now out through the end of 2022, uh, which would take us up to about 60,000 kilos. So all of this being done on a, an incremental or modular basis, you know, we're, we're certainly cognizant that there's this impending supply demand equilibrium. It may no longer make sense for us to continue to expand. The last thing we wanted was to sink hundred million dollars into an investment and have that asset sitting at idle or partial capacity. So we'll continue to expand as long as the market will bear uh, over the next few years. And, and 
you know, conversely, uh, you know, international opportunities or U.S. markets begin to open up, uh, you know, it, it, it's grow, baby, grow on the, the cultivation expansion. Uh, as that translates then into wholesale strategy, we took a little bit different approach than a lot of LPs. Uh, you know, a lot of producers last year were signing agreements with every single province and territory. Uh, we said, we're going to be focused. Uh, and a, a lot of reasoning behind that. And it wasn't simply that our intention was to be a small operator in one provincial market. Uh, we needed to get it right. Uh, we needed to uh, approach the market and work out all of the logistics kinks in terms of being able to be a good host and making repeat shipments to retailers. Yeah, a lot of this was brand strategy as well. Uh, we wanted to make sure when we enter a market, we have sufficient uh, production capacity and wholesale capacity to be present on store shelves. And the thinking here was you produce a high quality product, uh, you bring it to market. The last thing you wanna do is, is have that available for a consumer one day and then not available the next. Uh, in that case, you haven't really won over a customer, you've made a one-time transaction. So really what's going to drive revenue for licensed producers over the long term is building a brand, uh, building equity with the consumer that comes from creating a high quality product and, and a strong value proposition to the consumer. So Q4 last year, we rolled out the Manitoba market. We said we want to focus very quickly. We were on the shelves of every single store in Manitoba. Wow. Uh, and for our, our size, uh, have a very strong market share from a wholesale perspective in the province of Manitoba. Uh, from there, Q1, we branched out into the province of Saskatchewan. Uh, from there into Q2, branched out into the province of Alberta. Uh, recently, we announced we've been now listed in the province of BC. So we've now... I uh, continued our path westward. Uh, we hit the coast. Uh, we're now pivoting our focus back east where we're in discussions with Ontario, Quebec, and a number of other provinces. And as that production output capacity continues to build, uh, we bring on additional expansion markets. As much as we're single site focused from a cultivation standpoint, we do have ambitions on being a national distributor. So we'll continue to roll out those uh, announcements to the market as they're forthcoming. That's great. Now, what about retail? You build a company as vertically integrated. Can you lead us through the strategy? Yeah, so I mean, some of this, and a few reasons why we love retail. And, and, you know, firstly, I think is that, you know, there's that obvious attraction to recapturing the retail sales margin. Uh, when legalization happened, licensed producers such as ourselves went from being vertically integrated direct to the medical patient uh, and now having to deal with several layers of either provincial distributors, uh, or private or public retailers, uh, depending on the provincial framework. So obviously with that uh, comes splitting the margin with those other entities through to the retail consumer. Uh, so we wanted to recapture the retail sales margin. Uh, we also need to keep in mind that we're so limited from a marketing and advertising standpoint in Canada, the actual bricks and mortar retail stores are one of the very few platforms that we have to advertise our products, to, to take the Delta 9 brand and put it into the community in a bricks and mortar framework, it's one of our few avenues to actually advertise ourselves to the end consumer. It also gives us control over the direct and consumer sales force, uh, the product narrative. It allows us to really push the demand for Delta 9 products into the community. Uh, so, you know, overall, we looked at that, that total picture of, of where are the benefits in retail, and we saw a huge attraction to getting into the retail side. You know, the final point, and as I've touched on already in, in terms of benefits of being a retailer, is the, the live feedback and analytics. We've now done over 350,000 uh, retail for cannabis in the first 12 months. And with every transaction comes a data set of, you know, what are the demographics for the consumer? Uh, what types of products and price points are really resonating? Uh, product forms, uh, convenience, packaging sizes. We get to tinker with all of this, and every day we get live feedback from the consumer on what's working and what's not working. You know, where for a lot of producers, they're now, you know, kind of shooting in the dark, or, or they're having to pay uh, retailers for these types of feedback and, and analytics. So we like uh, like retail for a number of reasons. That's really good. You're able to determine what's going to happen based on the last year of history and data because. We've only been legal for a year. I have to keep reminding people. It's like they think that we've been legal forever. I'm like, this is a newly legal industry after being legal, illegal forever is now being legalized. And there's a lot of red tape. I mean, you're making it clear that it's difficult dealing with Health Canada. You can't advertise. 
I mean, you're literally, you got your hands tied. You can't advertise. So um, the fact that these companies, including yourself, is still generating great revenue, despite the fact you can't even advertise, it goes to show how much of a need there really is for this product. Yeah, I mean, really, I, I think we've just scratched the surface. Um, yeah, and, and as you pointed to, it, it's very much the first inning. We're about to roll over into the second inning with legalization 2.0 coming online. Um, you know, just the, the takeaways that we have in the first 12 months of, of gaining experience in the legal market, again, what worked, what didn't work, uh, where are, where is the end consumer really seeing value? Um, you know, a, a year ago, we all had the business plan uh, written for what, what was going to happen in the first 12 months of legalization. And I, I don't think there's anyone in the industry that could, that could sit back at this point and say, I got it right. Um, you know, there, there's just varying degrees of where did we hit, where did we miss. But, you know, with that become a lot of takeaways. You now refine that business plan. You put it into a little bit more of a real world setting. Um, you know, and from here, the where we position to allocate capital and invest and expand, I, I think comes from a place where we're much more educated. So, you know, I, I think to an extent, investors can take, you know, some degree of comfort that, that now companies are not investing based on speculation, they're investing based on real feedback. Uh, they know what ROI, ROC is going to be, at least a lot more educated decisions going into capital allocation than has ever been the case in the cannabis sector. So. You know, it's almost an exciting time to be a CEO or leading a management team where you can actually sit back and look and say, you know, this is a good place for us to invest capital. This is maybe an avenue where there's a slower return and, you know, given access to capital and, and the decisions management teams are having to make right now, um, it, it's a much better position to be in. You know, I'm very impressed. Uh, you are the youngest CEO in the cannabis sector. So congratulations on that. And you guys, your revenue is uh, your revenue growth is spectacular. So let's talk about it. So the company recently reported your Q2 financials. Can you lead us through the results? I believe you guys had 1100% revenue growth in one year. Am I correct in that? Uh, yeah, so I mean, on the, on the Q2 side, and you know, obviously we're, we're into Q4 here, company will report our Q3 revenue in about 30 days. Uh, but just speaking to the Q2 uh, results, we were about 8.9 million uh, top line revenue that was up, you know, as you pointed to, over 1,100% from the year prior. Uh, we would compare as well to the previous three month period as we like to give investors, you know, a sense of how are we doing quarter over quarter in the market, uh, as well as, as year over quarter. Uh, but that was up, I believe, about 50 or 60% from the previous quarter from about 5.6 million in Q1. Uh, so strong revenue growth just quarter over quarter, and that coming at a time where you know, what we've seen from even some of our largest competitors is that they've they've either gone sideways or they've taken a little bit of a step back. So I, I think very encouraging in terms of that top line revenue growth. Uh, as of the end of Q2, the company have produced uh, more than 21 million in trailing 12 month revenue. So, you know, for a, a company that in the 12 months prior to that had put up a little over 1 million in revenue, uh, again, we are now starting to see that growth, that execution. Um, and, and that's very much been our, our management focus is, you know, now legalization is here, it's, it's time to execute. Yeah, and that revenue growth, it seems as though, I went through your entire business plan, it seems as though it's, it's, you're planning to grow quarter over quarter, the way you guys are executing, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, you, you shoot to grow quarter, quarter over quarter, uh, really show that exponential growth. I mean, obviously, we expect strong growth, you know, year over quarter. Um, you know, it can be tough trying to play that quarterly gain of always trying to outpace yourself from the previous quarter. But I, I think, you know, if, if we're executing across our business units, um, you know, certainly achievable. Um, you know, I would point to as well, comparing our, our Q2 versus our Q1, we actually saw wholesale cannabis revenues go flat uh, at about 2.9 million for the quarter. Uh, but retail cannabis revenues were up uh, measurably. They were up 44% from the previous quarter. And our business to business unit where we sell our grow pods, cannabis genetics and consulting licensing services was very strong as well. So, you know, to point to our, I'll call that diversification of revenue strategy, uh, you know, we, we didn't necessarily beat ourselves in terms of the execution from our wholesale unit, 
uh, but we were able to outperform in our other business units, which led to an overall increase in the top line. So, you know, I, I certainly feel that in an industry that is is so uncertain, um, you know, I, I feel there's a benefit to having that diversified strategy where in any given unit, if there's not necessarily growth or more margin compression than we may expect, we have these other business units to lean on for growth uh, and see profitability. What about the company's balance sheet? How is the financial health of the company? Yeah, so as at the end of Q2, I believe we had about 15 and a half million in working capital, uh, but only about three and a half million in cash. Uh, subsequent to the end of quarter, we've undertaken a few financing activities to really make sure uh, that there is a good amount of cash and equivalents on the balance sheet. Uh, we completed an $11.8 million debenture offering uh, in July this year. Uh, very quickly on the heels of that, we had Canadian Western Bank, our, our uh, financial institution, increase our pre-existing credit facility to $18.1 million uh, from uh, $12 million. Uh, so in aggregate, almost $18 million in financing activities uh, occurred since the end of Q2. Uh, what that leaves us with is a, a very strong balance sheet in terms of cash on hand and access to capital through those credit facilities. Uh, again, as of end of last quarter, we had only drawn about 4.6 million uh, on that long-term credit facility. So still about 13 million uh, in access to capital under that facility. And of course, uh, you know, strong benefit to having access to conventional lending through a tier one bank uh, is all of that is non-dilutive capital uh, that comes at a very attractive interest rate, about 4.9%. So, you know, to your point on how far the industry has come uh, over the last few years, you know, for cannabis companies to now have access to, to credit facilities uh, at, at prime plus rates, I, I think is, is a strong uh, testament to, to how far the cannabis industry has come over the last few years. And, you know, you guys, are, you, know, you guys are lucky in Canada because they're not able to really do that yet on a large scale in America. From what I've, from what I've heard, they're still waiting for the Safe Banking Act to, uh, to go through. So that will hopefully open up the entire uh, the United States, and that will just be a whole different ball game. And I believe for the whole sector, when that happens, um, could you also touch base on your share structure? Our community is a community of investors. We love to find companies with tight share structures, tight floats. We don't want to see too much dilution in the market. Can you explain a little bit about your share structure? Uh, yeah, so you know, I'm going to refer back to the last MDNA. I think there's about uh, 87 or 88 million shares currently outstanding. Wow. Uh, about 100, about 123 million fully diluted, and that's when we factor in the conversion uh, of any out of the money warrants, options, uh, or conversion of our convertible debentures. Uh, so about 123 million uh, fully diluted. Um, you know, I, I would consider it a fairly clean cap structure. You know, compared to a few of the issuers in the market that have, you know, even upwards of a billion shares outstanding. Um, I think as well, we would certainly want to touch on, you know, a large percentage of insider and management ownership, uh, directors, officers, insiders own about 45, 50% uh, of the currently outstanding shares. Uh, so, I mean, obviously we're very aligned with the shareholder. Uh, now on the negative side, that can mean that the stock is more thinly traded at times than we would like. Uh, but, you know, I think even some of the more recent moves uh, up list to the main board TSX, trying to attract additional uh, institutional investor interest, you know, should help drive liquidity uh, as well uh, and, and visibility. But uh, again, overall, a fairly clean cap structure. Yeah. And one of my last questions before we get into the audience here, what was the rationale in getting listed? I know you mentioned it a little bit, but what was your rationale in getting listed on the TSX? And congratulations for getting listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange, by the way. Yes, I mean, uh, like many other issuers, we went public on the venture, uh, you know, easier in terms of reporting requirements, uh, capital requirements, et cetera, to, to come on through an RTO in, into the venture exchange. Uh, we always had it in our mind that once the business had, had progressed to a certain extent, uh, we would be looking for that uplisting. Uh, really to, to, you know, on the front end of it, demonstrate the maturity of the company, that this is no longer a venture stage issuer, that, you know, there's significant revenue. Uh, that the company's trending towards profitability, that, um, you know, we, we've reached that level of maturity to trade on the big board with, with uh, you know, the, the largest companies uh, in the country. 
Um, you know, I, I think the other benefits as well, again, as I mentioned, increased visibility, you know, as a main board company, I mean, we, we hear that feedback from, you know, everything from retail investors to, to the largest institutionals is just that, you know, they're apprehensive to trade venture and, and CSE listed companies. Uh, so I think puts us in that, that class uh, of, of the big board listed companies, uh, gives us increased exposure. Uh, allows for for now new institutional interest to come in where, you know, again, they're, they're important for people to keep in mind, there's still a lot of money sitting on the sidelines. Uh, right now, a lot of institutionals that are wanting to see, see these companies actually on their business plan, uh, that there's revenue growth, that there there is trending towards profitability before they will become involved. But I think that almost becomes the next stage of, of growth and maturity in, in the financial markets for cannabis is is starting to see some of those larger players. And, uh, you know, again, I, I think a lot of this was about positioning Delta 9 so that we have that listing. Uh, we are setting ourselves in that category and, and we're ready to continue to execute from there. That's great. Now, do you mind if I get a couple questions from the audience? Please. Uh, one of the questions is, um, what do you see as obstacles for Delta 9? Ooh, um, <laughs> you know, good question. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, the state of financial markets over the last four to six months have, um, you know, have been difficult and, and really just from the context that it, it means that access to capital becomes more of a challenge. We're obviously, you know, cognizant of dilutive impacts of, of equity or, or equity like financings. Um, you know, when we're looking to invest, there, there's a difference between having a 50 million market cap and a 500 million market cap uh, in how you may approach that growth strategy. So I, I think you know, our, ourselves included, the downturn in the markets has made it so that companies uh, need to become much more, uh, uh, you know, m much more cognizant of the, of, the, of the cost of capital uh, and dilutive implications for their shareholders and really allocating capital uh, appropriately. Um, you know, major obstacles, I mean, we, we point to that we have pending approvals with, uh, with Health Canada for additional expansion capacity. Um, you know, I guess the positive takeaway there is that that capital is already spent uh, and there will be a significant increase in output capacity that comes along with that, that um, uh, the issuance of that license. Uh, you know, the obstacle there is that it is still taking in some cases months to receive these expansion approvals from the regulator. Um, you know, so we're all, always having to deal with the red tape that comes along with, with government approvals at the federal level. Um, you know, extrapolates out into the provincial markets as well. Uh, where, you know, in some cases, retail licenses, um, we're working through the process to acquire licenses in the province of Alberta right now, walking through that process with the regulators. Um, you know, so this is, a, to be realistic, a very regulated industry. Uh, you know, frankly, and, and we've always been of the opinion that strong operators should welcome uh, that style of regulation because it, it really, it does increase barriers to entry. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, if you are in this for the long haul, uh, the execution is there. Um, you know, it, it becomes a blip on the radar when we look out over a five or 10 year uh, horizon for return on our invested capital. Uh, you know, really beyond that, I, I think there's a certain amount of competitive risk in the market given we're seeing provinces like Ontario really trip over themselves in terms of retail store rollouts. We know there's this aggressive ramp up uh, in companies bringing on production capacity, and yet we're not necessarily countrywide seeing an aggressive rollout in the number of retail stores, which really push the demand curve. So, you know, how does Delta 9 defend against that as a risk? Well, you know, I, I, frankly, two sides of it. Uh, we've been pushing aggressively uh, to invest in automation at our cultivation and processing facilities to drive down our cost per gram. Uh, we hit $1.05 a gram production cost uh, last quarter. Now puts us in a, you know, I'll call it industry leading category in terms of efficiency. Uh, it means that from a competitive standpoint, we're now not only positioning to be high quality, but we're also low cost. Uh, so that risk of margin compression in the cultivation and wholesale side of the industry, I, I think is somewhat de-risked. Uh, the other side of it is vertical integration and again, pushing the demand for Delta 9 products through our own retail chain. Uh, we know that we're not necessarily going to become locked out of the market with a limited number of retail stores because we're driving the demand curve for our own products. So 
I, I think there's a few things that we can do looking forward in terms of the SWOT analysis to see those risks and try and position them to be opportunities. So, um, you know, I, I guess beyond that, it will be exciting to see how uh, inning two rolls out uh, over the next 12 months. Very good. I'm excited to see how you guys do. Another question from Alberto Ramos is, is the increased sale of pods part of your revenue strategy? Yeah, so the, the grow pod uh, sales, I mean, there's really a few strategies there. Um, yeah, I and mean, really, this was a business that came to us. We, we started to roll out the pods to commercialize them on a mass scale. And we had people start to approach us saying, you know, I'm looking to start my own production facility. Uh, I want to look at using your grow pods. Our thesis from there was that if we put our pods, which are currently Health Canada approved, into a new facility, and we consult with that company to provide standard operating procedures, sanitation programs, uh, quality assurance back end, really help them with the Health Canada licensing component through a consulting agreement, we can expedite their license. And we were able to get our license for our first third party facility uh, in Ontario in about nine months, uh, which as anyone knows in this industry is a very quick lead time from investment through to cultivation license. Uh, so I, I think we proved the concept on that thesis that we could expedite the licensing by using the grow pod as this modular unit for cultivation expansion. And then from there, there's the added benefit of, of selling our, our cannabis genetics. Now we don't give people access to the full portfolio, uh, but it's another value add revenue stream for us. And then from there, uh, we typically are signing either rights of first refusal or long-term supply agreements to purchase the product from these facilities on an ongoing basis. So we get the upfront construction revenue in the grow pods, we get the consulting revenue, we get the genetics revenue, and then we get the ongoing distribution revenue to intake that product, process it, and put it out through the di provincial distribution markets. So we saw it almost as getting our cake and eating it too, in terms of having a diversified revenue stream on more of the, you know, call it the infrastructure, the B2B, the picks and shovel side of the industry, but then having a longer term revenue path through these partnerships we're creating with craft cultivators and with mid-sized cultivators in the industry. So, you know, again, I, I don't want to say we just tripped into this business, but it, it's been, a, I think, a very complementary business uh, vertical for us to get into. And again, provides that diversified exposure for investors that I, I think, um, you know, is unique, certainly in the space. Do you keep track of the amount of investors you guys have? Are you aware of the number? Is that, so one of the me members asked that Ooh. question. You know, that that's a good question. I mean, in terms of registered shareholders, just people who were voting for our last AGM, it's into the thousands. Wow, great. Um, so it's a very good. large number. Um, institutional holders, at least as of the last report I had, uh, non-objecting institutional holders were only about 4%. Uh, so for the most part, I mean, we have directors, officers, insiders at 45% plus. We have institutionals at you know, call it 5%. We have a strategic investor in Oxley uh, Cannabis at 5 or 6%. Uh, and the balance is all retail investors. And again, at least as of the last annual general meeting, it, it was in the thousands. And I have a question. Now, what do you think about the fact that the sector has clearly gone down to a 52-week low across the board and been down for seven months in a row? <coughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I like to ask the tough questions. Well, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, obviously it hasn't been a fun ride for anyone. I, I don't want to put a, a you know, overtly positive spin on it. I mean, as I said, it, it kind of resets the management focus towards really putting a hard eye on, on investment, you know, pivoting towards positive cash flow from operations or you know, free cash flow, uh, positive adjusted EBITDA, you know, more quickly than perhaps you would have previously been focused on it. I mean, my, my general sense is, is this reset is not necessarily a bad thing for investors. Um, you know, we had a lot of, I'll call it the largest market cap companies, which really started to trade at multiples to future revenue and earnings that, you know, even looking out over a five year period was tough to justify that valuation. Um, now resetting the valuations of those large cap guys has, has meant that you know, now those valuations are more reasonable to the mid to near term uh, revenue and earnings targets. So I think it's provided a more reasonable entry point 
for anyone looking to become involved in the large cap names. Uh, you know, unfortunately, there's the mid cap, the small cap companies like Delta 9 that have been kind of dragged, dragged down with the tide. Um, you know, I certainly think the execution has been there from a, a revenue standpoint, uh, uh, from a fundamental standpoint, which, you know, I mean, like every CEO, I certainly feel our company is undervalued uh, at our current levels. Um, and, you know, from there, I, I think the reset in these valuations for the mid and small cap guys has presented real buying opportunities where you look at a company in the 50 to 250 million market cap range and you plot out their execution over the next three to five years, you know, there could be a 500 million to billion dollar market cap company there. Uh, you know, so as investors start to reset, uh, look for fundamentals, look at the sector and go, you know, where can I make two times, three times, five times my money over the next three years? There are names in that mid and, and small cap space that certainly fit that bill. Um, you know, so as with any market downturn, uh, it hurts. Uh, where there's blood in the streets, I think people are supposed to be buying. Uh, there's certainly no shortage of blood in the streets. So, um, you know, again, presents a buying opportunity for investors. Great. I, I, I like that answer. Now, uh, one of the questions is, do you have any current or future international plans? Yeah, so we've done a little bit on the international side thus far. Um, we have done some genetic sales into Australia and Tasmania. Uh, we have begun to market that offering internationally, and we're, we are getting some feedback, although to be realistic, uh, those export permits are long lead time. Um, you know, a lot of red tape goes into international transactions for cannabis right now. So, um, you know, I, I think the longer term look for us is, is we are continuing that build out of our phase two facilities here as a part of that uh, includes getting our facility to a point where it can be EU GMP certified, so European Union G Good Manufacturing Practices certified to allow us to export to the EU. Uh, I believe there's only five or six facilities in Canada right now that have that certification. Um, so the longer term look here is obviously, you know, as markets like Germany, the UK, France, et cetera, begin to open up, uh, there will be significant export opportunities on the medical side of the business first, uh, and over the longer term, hopefully on the recreational side of the market. So we, we want it to be positioned uh, so that we not only have these large facilities, we also have the ability to access international growth markets through exports. Uh, and saw that as a, a, a more capital wise um, look at international expansion than setting up facilities in every single one of these companies, which is obviously very capital intensive. So. Um, there is a longer term look towards exports. We are continuing to look at our genetics offering as, um, you know, a way to potentially form these relationships internationally. Uh, we're also looking at sale of our grow pods internationally as, you know, that is again, more of the picks and shovels side of the industry allows us to look at a market like the U S where cultivation or, or any activities touching the plant are not necessarily legal at the federal level. But is there a way for us to enter that market, have exposure to growth in these smaller state over state markets, but still remain compliant with the requirements of our, our of the, the Toronto Stock Exchange that we not touch the plant or do business in the US? So um, again, I, I think there are definitely some pokers in the fire uh, on the international side. But you know, I always use this statistic, the value of Canadian acquisitions of international assets last year, just in Europe, eclipsed $1 billion. Wow. It produced less than $20 million in revenue, most of that at a loss in the last calendar year. So again, if I'm a CEO looking at where is the best return on invested capital, I'm not looking at Europe or a lot of these international markets and seeing that as the best way for me to deploy capital. The best return that I can see uh, for my shareholders is investing in increased cultivation, uh, wholesale distribution, processing assets, uh, as well as expansion in our retail chain across Western Canada. So uh, again, it's on the horizon. I look out 10 to 25 years. Um, I see Delta 9 as bu building a business model here in Canada that can be taken to any jurisdiction around the world and multiple. Uh, so, you know, Canada, in some cases, I think is becoming the testing ground for what stands to happen across the world uh, over the next 25 years and beyond. That's incredible. I think that uh, your strategy is very sound and I really look forward to seeing you guys grow and achieve your objectives. 
Once again, John, thank you for joining us today. Um, our entire community will be watching you guys very, very closely. And do you have any goals as far as profitability or targets you guys are setting right now for when we could see profit? Yeah, so I mean, we, we haven't provided formal guidance to the market. Um, you know, apprehensive to put guidance out and then yes. end up in a position where we're having to pull back that guidance because of the market uncertainty. Um, you know, I think generally investors can look at the last two quarters as that, you know, as that revenue growth has increased, uh, that adjusted EBITDA loss has narrowed. Um, you know, so I think we showed very important progress from Q1 to Q2. Uh, you could extrapolate out that with the same uh, gross margin, similar levels of SG&A, you know, as soon as the company is achieving 11 million or so in quarterly revenue, uh, we've crossed that threshold. Uh, right. You know, as I mentioned, we're not only taking a hard look at where are we allocating capital from a, uh, from a CapEx perspective, uh, we're also taking a very hard look at expenses. We have been for the last few quarters. Uh, we know investors are expecting to see profit here, or at least a very clear path to profitability uh, over our Q3, Q4, and into early next year. Uh, so expect to see the company continuing to chart in that direction over the next few quarters. And uh, we're going to certainly drive the ship with that mandate uh, moving forward. That's great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We wish you all the best in your future endeavors. It is John, the CEO of Delta 9 Cannabis. Thank you for joining us today and have yourself a great day, John. And congratulations great. on all your success. Great day today. TSX listing. And like I said, one of the youngest, if not the youngest CEO in the cannabis sector. And you're doing great and very well spoken. Congratulations on all your success so far. And I'm sure there's a lot more coming. Thank you very much for taking the time. Have a great day.